Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to Southeast. Well, we have uh, people coming all the time, so I guess we can start uh, slowly start the session by, uh, I guess, letting me introduce the session a little bit and uh, probably will uh, start the session officially in five minutes so we can uh, let the people in uh, slowly. So you might already notice, I just want to remind you like the recording is always on. So um, if you feel not comfortable being, you know, videotaped, uh, you can switch off your camera or rename yourself. Uh, and you can always, you know, turn on and uh, rename again, if you like. Okay, people are still coming. I guess it's an early morning, <laughs> so probably takes a little bit of time to let the computer, to let the laptop start it. So while I admitting all our audiences, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, you know send greetings to everyone. Jim, I really like your background. It looks very calming. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes, I just, you know it's it's a little hard to to watch from underwater here, but it's okay. <laughs> The reception, a little wishy-washy sometimes. Is it? <laughs> oh, I like that, wishy-washy. Gotten my puns out of the way. My, my presentation will be pun-free now. Okay. Norman looks like he's enjoying the conference horizontally, just kind of lying on the floor. It, true. <laughs> Kind of like how my students enjoyed this semester, I suppose. Have you made this choice to be here out of a lot of choices? I mean, I saw the uh, the six or seven on Saltese, but I'm supposed to be in a conference at my own school at John Abbott right now as well. Um, and uh, I, you know, this just looked like the the most interesting of the ten or twelve choices, but. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here or somewhere else. It seems Alors, uh, comme on dit en français, tu mets la barre haute. <laughs> like for the Canadian, like, like for the Habs. The, the stick is high. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, this is the most interesting place to be right now. Welcome, Jim. <laughs> Won't tell Jack. <laughs> okay, I see now feels like most of people already come into the session. So maybe allow me to start it a little bit. So I guess I'll officially greeting you all. So welcome everyone to the Southeast 2021. So now you're at the roundtable session on enhancing engagement, interesting topic. So my name is Chao Zhang. I'm the chair of the session. Oh, oops, another one, yeah. <laughs> so we have three presentations in the session today. Uh, before I give them the floor, I just uh, a few things I need to share with you all. So oh, more people are coming, I know it. Okay, so just to remind you that the session is being recorded. So if you, if you feel uncomfortable being recorded, please consider switching the camera off and renaming yourself. And we are also using the closed captioning. So feel free to hide the subtitles by clicking on more and hide subtitle in your Zoom window. You can always turn them back on at any time by clicking on more and show subtitle. Okay, so now allow me to introduce you uh, the three presentations we're gonna have today and their respective authors. So we'll start, so oh, 
more people. Okay, <laughs> that's good timing. So today we're going to start uh, with uh, Bruno Pulivac, Nachman Royal, and Vincent Labesh from Université de Montréal. Uh, they will present you the results of an action research with flipped classrooms in six institutions, lessons learned and implications for practice. Okay, the next we're going to have Cynthia Fan, uh, Wittler, uh, Deliver, Iris School, Uling Yu, Tamara Weston, and Anita Palmer from McGill University. They will talk about Fratka. That sounds very exciting. Adapting collaborative learning communities for the virtual world. Uh, last but not least, Veronique Broly, uh, Honda Amasa, and Marcy Slapkov. Uh, also from McGill University, will bring you the let's keep the conversation going, engaging inst instructors in pedagogical discussion during and beyond the remote learning. It's very timely. Okay, so now I guess I'll just give floor to our first presentation presenters. Uh, and sorry, before that, I also want to remind that for each, uh, we're going to do a panel format today. So we have three presentations, uh, one by one. Each are gonna take 15 minutes. And in the end, uh, I'm gonna create three breakout rooms. So you, you as audience, you can freely choose, uh, you know, which room you want to enter or, you know, just uh, shift in or around rooms to ask your questions or have, you know, discussions, conversations with the authors. Okay, so let's start this. Um, so probably you can take it over. Okay, thank you very much. Uh Ciao uh, for uh, letting me in. So, uh, uh, l'entente que j'ai avec mes amis anglophones du Québec, et j'en ai beaucoup, c'est qu'on parle chacun dans notre langue. Uh, alors, vos questions peuvent être en français, je vais vous, en anglais, je, je vais, je, donc je vais faire la présentation en français, et, mais je suis capable très bien de comprendre vos questions. Et si vous avez besoin que je traduise certaines parties de diapo, vous pouvez uh, le dire à l'audio et je le ferai. Alors, uh, dans la présentation qu'on a présentée, comme c'est un délai court, on va vraiment mettre l'accent sur « Lessons learned and implication for practices ». Donc, vous présente, ça ne sera pas la présentation de recherche uh, vraiment classique, ça va être vraiment focalisé sur un peu, un, un petit peu la, la problématique netto, mais beaucoup les résultats et l'interprétation dans le format qu'on a. Donc, uh, oui, c'est une recherche action uh, qu'on a faite avec uh, six collèges, deux universités, autour de la problématique de réussite. Euh, en fait, on a beaucoup de statistiques qui montrent que, surtout dans l'enseignement collégial, euh, mais aussi dans l'enseignement universitaire, on reste avec des taux de persévérance et de réussite qui sont problématiques. Et là, derrière ça, en fait, ça implique des changements dans les pratiques pédagogiques. Et l'idée de changer les pratiques pédagogiques, bien, ça nous questionne tout de suite sur comment est-ce qu'on fait pour euh, justement que les enseignants euh, puissent transformer leurs pratiques pédagogiques pour avoir des pratiques pédagogiques qui vont davantage favoriser la réussite. Au moment où on a fait la présentation du projet de recherche, euh, en 2016, on a fait la présentation et le projet s'est déroulé à partir de 2017. Bien, la classe inversée, Flip Classroom, il y avait vraiment une grande popularité. Euh, il n'y avait pas beaucoup de résultats de recherche encore. Euh, pour nous, euh, en fait, euh, la définition qu'on a retenue, il y a plusieurs définitions de la classe inversée. Mais pour nous, la classe inversée, c'est un format où il y a des activités d'apprentissage assisté par ordinateur à l'extérieur de la classe, par exemple des vidéos, mais pas juste des vidéos, ça peut être autre chose aussi, ça peut être des examens, autre chose, et aussi des activités d'apprentissage actif réalisées en classe. So for us, uh, um, flip classroom, the active ingredient was uh, active learning, in class active learning, but that was not in the mind of all participants, at least uh, at the side. Donc, en réalité, on a eu trois collèges et deux universités, six chercheurs universitaires, dont Normand et plusieurs autres, quatre conseillers technopédagogiques, environ 25 enseignants, mais qui variaient d'un trimestre à l'autre avec plusieurs assistants de recherche. Vincent Laberge, qui est parmi nous, faisait aussi sa maîtrise en cadre de ce projet-là. Alors, les objectifs, on s'intéressait d'un côté aux connaissances, préférences, aux pratiques pédagogiques des enseignants, à leur évolution dans le temps et aussi, d'un autre côté, à leurs effets sur la motivation, sur l'engagement et sur la réussite ou plutôt la perception d'apprentissage des étudiants. 
les cadres conceptuels qu'on mobilisait, c'est vraiment le modèle de, de motivation des attentes et de la valeur, euh, dans, donc particulièrement le modèle de Pintridge, dans lequel, euh, en fait, euh, it's a, um, value expectancy model, donc la valeur, c'est quoi? La valeur, c'est la valeur, l'utilité de la tâche, la pertinence de la tâche. Euh, les attentes, c'est le sentiment d'auto-efficacité, la perception de contrôle, puis la valeur a un côté affectif. On s'est intéressé, on a mobilisé la théorie de l'intérêt aussi pour regarder l'intérêt individuel, l'intérêt situationnel. Euh, on a dans l'engagement, les auteurs nous disent, Blumenfeld et Frédéric, qu'il qu y a trois dimensions à l'engagement. Il y a l'engagement comportemental, qui est ce qu'on peut voir, la partie visible de l'engagement, les comportements comportement observable, mais l'engagement cognitif qui est plus subtil, qui est un peu les stratégies d'apprentissage, stratégie cognitive, métacognitive, puis l'engagement affectif, dans quelle mesure je m'investis émotionnellement. Et là, il y a un petit twist, c'est qu'on a distingué les trois volets de l'engagement euh, sur les activités qui se déroulaient en classe versus les activités hors classe. Donc, écoutez, les objectifs, euh, je les passe rapidement, adresser un portrait préliminaire euh, des, des pratiques de classe de au post-secondaire, déterminer les attentes et la valeur accordée par les étudiants et les enseignants aux activités d'apprentissage, analyser les liens entre les préférences et pratiques pédagogiques des enseignants et l'engagement, motivation, l'apprentissage, la réussite, décrire le processus d'appropriation de la classe inversée par les enseignants. Mais on avait aussi un objectif d'action qui est un peu celui sur lequel je vais beaucoup présenter, qui était de développer un modèle de formation, de collaboration et d'accompagnement technopédagogique qui soit efficace du point de vue du changement des pratiques enseignantes. Alors, euh, en fait, je vous présente 11 résultats synthèse euh, qui portent à la fois sur le dispositif de formation et d'accompagnement qu'on a mis en place sur la mise en place de la classe inversée et sur la participation à des recherches collaboratives. Mais euh, le premier résultat peut-être le plus intéressant, c'est un résultat qui n'est pas dans le rapport, c'est qu'en en fait, on avait les participants, et c'est un résultat informel que, que j'ai pu vérifier avec les contacts que j'ai eus avec les conseillers pédagogiques et les participants qu'on a eus, ce n'est pas vraiment un résultat scientifique, mais ce qu'on a pu voir, c'est que ceux et celles qui avaient développé une pratique de classe inversée, en réalité, ils sont très, très bien adapté et très rapidement au passage obligé à la formation à distance qu'on a connue pendant la pandémie. Donc, c'est peut-être le résultat le plus important. Puis, euh, en faisant de la classe inversée, finalement, c'est un modèle de formation hybride et ça les amène à gérer un peu la distance. Et quand ils sont retrouvés en contexte de distance obligée, ça a été plus facile. Alors, le premier résultat le plus important, c'est que le modèle d'accompagnement et de développement professionnel qu'on a mis en place a été efficace. On a réussi à amener une transformation des pratiques enseignantes. Et euh, en fait, il y avait beaucoup de choses. On avait développé, on, en fait, j'avais fait un mot qu'en 2015, auquel plusieurs, plusieurs conseillers pédagogiques avaient participé. On a développé deux cours crédités. On a fait beaucoup de formations. Et dans les cours crédités, toutes les ressources qui avaient été développées dans le mot qui est dans les cours étaient à la disposition des conseillers pédagogiques qui pouvaient les réutiliser avec leurs enseignants. On, a, on avait un dispositif très complet de développement professionnel, de formation. L'accompagnement était à long terme. Il y avait l'accompagnement des conseillers pédagogiques locaux. Alors, ça nous a amené à, en fait, ça nous a amené à une réflexion sur c'est quoi un modèle de développement professionnel efficace. Euh, en réalité, euh, ça nous a amené à penser qu'il fallait que ce modèle-là soit flexible, qu'il fallait qu'il soit de longue durée, puis euh, l'expérimentation sur le terrain, nous avions quand même aussi des données euh, de questionnaires qui étaient collectées auprès des étudiants, et euh, nous, on rencontrait les enseignants dans une entrevue qui n'était pas vraiment une entrevue de recherche, mais avec les résultats du questionnaire pour leur partager, euh, en fait, la réaction des étudiants, et ça, c'était très intéressant sur le plan du développement professionnel, euh, donc c'était l'entrevue de suivi, et ça alimentait vraiment le développement professionnel. Euh, cette image là en fait, représente euh, visuellement une régression logistique. Euh, et là, le résultat important là-dedans, en fait, on n'avait pas beaucoup de choses qui étaient significatives. On avait, euh, en fait, avoir de l'expérience en classe inversée. Autrement dit, ceux qui sont restés longtemps, dans, ceux qui sont restés sur plusieurs itérations, sont ceux qui ont vraiment développé des pratiques euh, plus efficaces en classe inversée. Donc, dans l'analyse multiniveau qu'on a effectuée, le temps et l'expérience acquise euh, est euh, démontré comme important. 
ça nous amène à, à en fait, euh, identifier les caractéristiques qui nous semblent les plus importantes pour vraiment transformer les pratiques. Donc, c'est déjà un accompagnement qui est fourni par les conseillers pédagogiques et technopédagogiques. L'accompagnement de proximité, c'était pour nous très important. Euh, je dirais, notre, notre propre approche de formation misait sur l'apprentissage actif et collaboratif. Il y avait beaucoup d'occasions d'échanger avec leurs pairs, avec les CP, avec les chercheurs, dans des webinaires, dans des rencontres durant la session, dans, dans des journées de transfert. Donc, on, on rendait actifs les apprenants. Euh, puis je vous dirais qu'on a réussi à mettre en place aussi euh, des communautés de pratiques pour résoudre des problèmes de manière collaborative. Et en fait, je vous parlais de l'entrevue de suivi, et ça, c'est un facteur important, l'introduction de la rétroaction des étudiants euh, par le biais des données collectées sur les questionnaires qui étaient partagées et discutées avec euh, les enseignants. Puis le tout visait à alimenter un processus de réflexion sur sa pratique enseignante. Donc, euh, ça nous amène à une réflexion sur c'est quoi un, un processus de développement professionnel professionnel efficace. Euh, il y a Kennedy qui nous en fait mentionne que qui a développé un continuum qui nous dit que si on a des ateliers transmissifs de courte durée, il ne faut pas nécessairement s'attendre à ce qu'on transforme les pratiques. Il y a de l'intérêt. Donc, les éléments d'un développement professionnel efficace, on a publié un article, Normand Moi et Edith Grusselin, dans la RIPU récemment, euh, l'année dernière. Donc, c'est déjà une formation de longue durée. C'est une approche euh, euh, où on a, euh, en fait, où on sollicite la réflexion sur la pratique, la réflexion sur les conceptions. Euh, où on, en fait, où on a le, la participation collective, la collaboration, on sollicite l'apprentissage actif des enseignants, puis on introduit le feedback des étudiants. Donc, voilà une référence pour Kennedy. Ensuite, euh, un autre petit élément, c'est qu'un deuxième résultat, on a vu qu'il y avait des profils différents d'enseignants, et puis c'est vraiment le sentiment d'efficacité personnelle, « teacher efficacy », et ces différentes dimensions qui distinguent les enseignants. Et en fait, c'est cohérent avec le résultat précédent parce que le teacher efficacy, le sentiment d'efficacité personnelle, semble se développer avec la formation, avec l'expérience, avec l'accompagnement. Alors, on a un effet genre qu'on n'a pas pu vraiment expliqué euh, parce que dans nos analyses multiniveaux, en fait, le sentiment d'efficacité personnelle est disparu euh, avec euh, d'autres variables. C'est confondu un peu avec le genre et on suspecte qu'il y a peut-être un effet confondant. Dans les premières analyses, le sentiment d'efficacité personnelle ressortait dans les analyses multiniveaux, mais je vous dirais en quelque sorte que la variance a été mangée par le genre parce que les hommes semblent avoir un sentiment d'efficacité personnelle euh, plus élevé. Donc, on a en fait, en fait une analyse de classification euh, sur euh, les variables enseignantes. Donc, on a tracé trois profils et euh, la chose qui est quand même intéressante, c'est que dans l'ensemble, toutes les échelles du sentiment d'efficacité personnelle euh, ben, augmentent du profil 3 au profil 1. Euh, et puis, en fait, les étudiants du profil 3 ont des préférences individuelles euh, plus élevé. Euh, et là, ce qui est quand même intéressant, c'est dans notre profil 2, l'approche magistro-centrée, on est euh, basé sur le euh, approach of teaching inventory de Trigwell. Euh, notre profil 2 il est un peu particulier parce qu'il a à la fois, euh, je dirais, des préférences pédocentrées qui est élevée à 4.9 et aussi une approche magistraux centré, donc c'est-à-dire centré sur les enseignants, qui est aussi élevé. Donc, c'est un profil où il y avait coexistence euh, d'être à la fois centré sur les étudiants et d'être centré sur les enseignants. Donc, on a trouvé ça intéressant. Euh, euh, un troisième résultat, c'est de se demander comment est-ce que les enseignants arrivent à changer leur pratique. Ça nous vient d'où? Alors, c'est un processus euh, qu'on a identifié comme étant systémique et même si plusieurs études remettent en question l'idée de la pertinence de la formation, mais pour nous, ça a été le facteur numéro un. Les enseignants qui ont transformé leur pratique avaient souvent, euh, euh, en fait, c'était dans un cheminement professionnel où leur réflexion avait été beaucoup par la formation, mais ça a été aussi euh, souvent par des problématiques de motivation et d'engagement qu'ils observaient en classe par le désir d'innover. 
Et en fait, autrement dit, on pouvait avoir plusieurs dé événements déclencheurs du développement professionnel et la formation pouvait en être un, les problématiques désir d'innover. Euh, et le contexte départemental pouvait aussi avoir un résultat sur dans quelle mesure c'est facile d'innover ou non. Et ça, on a mis ça. Et là, en fait, on, on vous le montre, on les a classés par ordre d'importance, mais dans une des analyses qu'on a faites, on peut voir aussi que c'est, euh, en fait, ces événements critiques-là euh, peuvent coexister. Donc, ça peut être une combinaison de ces événements. Ça, ça nous amène un peu, quand on situe ça dans notre modèle de développement professionnel, le domaine de Clark et Hollingworth, bien, le, la, la formation, ça, ça se situe dans le domaine externe, les sources d'information, mais euh, en fait, les résultats saillants, euh, l'observation des conséquences, l'engagement, euh, la motivation des étudiants qui est observée, ça peut aussi être la source du processus par lequel un enseignant euh, s'engage dans le développement professionnel. Donc, écoutez, les pistes de solutions, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on a euh, rapidement? On pourra peut-être mettre ça dans la discussion. J'ai euh, un petit problème avec mon PowerPoint, mais il ne me reste qu'une minute. Alors, je vous présente un dernier résultat, puis on discutera des interprétations de ces résultats dans le breakout room pour ceux euh, qui veulent tester. En fait, il y a quand même un certain nombre de défis euh, pour faire la flip classroom. Il y a l'adhésion des étudiants, dans quelle mesure c'est un défi persistant pour comment faire en sorte que les étudiants fassent des choses qui sont attendues d'eux. Euh, la planification pédagogique est plus exigeante pour les enseignants. Puis le développement de certaines compétences, particulièrement pour la conception vidéo. La conception d'apprentissage actif a été quelque chose qui a été difficile pour plusieurs enseignants et la gestion de classe. Et ça requiert du temps et des efforts considérables, mais on peut utiliser aussi des ressources qui ont été utilisées par d'autres. Alors, je suis au bout de mon temps, j'aurai d'autres résultats à vous présenter, mais euh, voilà, pour respecter le temps, j'arrête ici et je vous invite à venir dans le breakout room en discuter avec Normand, moi et Vincent. Merci beaucoup. <rire> Thank you, Professor Polo. Yeah, actually perfect on timing and actually, uh, yeah. So I guess we'll leave the questions at the end. As we said, later we're going to have separate uh, breakout rooms. Uh, so you, you can communicate or ask your questions uh, as you, the way you want. Okay, so now I guess uh, we'll switch to our second presenters. So Iris and Willie, take it over if you want. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, okay. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Whitley and I'm currently a fourth year student studying anatomy and cell biology. I participated in Fresca in my first and second years at McGill University and I found it to be super helpful with helping me to understand the course content in my various subjects. I was then able to join the Fresca team in 2020 when completing an f research project and how virtual learning has had an impact on Fresca. I'm currently still a part of the team as an administrator and a team mentor. Hi, my name is Iris and I'm a fourth year undergraduate student in anatomy and cell biology. I initially became involved with Fresca in fall 2019 when I completed an FSI research project on how in-person Fresca works as a collaborative learning community. I then continued this year working as a Fresca admin. We have the rest of the Fresca admin team listed here who are also here with us today and will be answering questions in the chat. They have provided us with much support in our work and they have all made significant contributions to the Fresca program itself. And so today we'll be presenting on Fresca, which is a collaborative learning initiative founded at McGill and how we have adapted it for online learning. First of all, you may ask, well, what exactly is Fresca? Fresca stands for First Year Residence Cafeteria and is a tutorial program targeting first and second year STEM students. Fresca aims to create a learning community, especially for these large first and second year classes where people may feel especially isolated. And it's a place that bridges students, team mentors, TAs, and occasionally even professors. For your reference, team mentors are the undergraduate peer mentors who have done well in a recent offering of the course, and TAs are the teaching assistants. On the one hand, Fresca provides students with academic support, encompassing all of the major first and second year courses in physics, math, biology, chemistry. 
On the other hand, Fresca also aims to foster collaborations and connections between its participants, creating a tightly knit community network for better learning. In an in-person setting, we held the Fresca sessions in one of the McGill cafeterias. In this case, students can move freely from table to table where the team mentors and the TAs are situated, serving as a one-stop shop for many of the courses they may be taking. And here's a photo of in-person Fresca. As you can see, we have the different mentors situated at different tables dedicated to the specific courses, and students are free to move around in this space. This year, given the online learning environment, we moved Fresca to the Microsoft Teams or MS Teams platform in an attempt to replicate this type of flexible learning community. Additionally, to encourage student engagement, we created the virtual cafe and the virtual library, which I will explain in the next slide. Of course, one question that comes up often is, why not Zoom? Most people are familiar with Zoom and it's easy to use. However, after some careful discussions, we thought that MS Teams would better suit the purposes of Fresca. And I'll explain to you how we have set up our Fresca Teams platform in the next slide as well. Of course, virtual Fresca comes with its pros and cons. For instance, by moving Fresca online, we have removed spatial constraints that were often an issue in the physical space. However, other issues can arise in the online setting, which we'll further explore during our presentation today. So here's our virtual Fresca platform on MS Teams. On the left, we have the different course channels where the mentors and the TAs will hold their sessions. Students are able to navigate between the different courses essentially seamlessly by hopping in and out of the ongoing calls, which is kind of similar to how they were able to move between the different tables in the in-person format. Other than the course channel, we also have the general channel for announcements from the admins, and we also have the virtual cafe. So the virtual cafe is a place where students can start their own meetings and study together with peers, which serves to improve engagement during online learning. In the fall 2020 semester, we also had a separate virtual library channel as a text only channel, but we decided to merge the two for the winter 2021 semester since they seem to be underused. As you can see here, students have a lot more flexibility and freedom to move around on the MS Teams platform. If we were to use Zoom, for example, we would have to use different breakout rooms in addition to different links for the different courses, which may become unnecessarily complicated. Thus, to serve the purpose of being a flexible and accessible one-stop shop for multiple courses, we resorted to using MS Teams. We will now present you with some quantitative and qualitative data to compare the pros and cons of the in-person and virtual formats, focusing specifically on the student perspective. Some of the quantitative data involved gathering attendance data from all participating courses in fall 2020. This data was then compared to attendance results from fall 2019. Attendance was taken for all students attending Fresca from week one to week 11. There were 2,110 students total who attended Fresca in fall 2020 and a total of 2,237 students attended in fall 2019. Repeated students were included. As shown in the fig figures, the overall weekly attendance for all associated courses across the term decreased after week three for fall 2020 and after week two for fall 2019. The weekly attendance for both terms followed a similar pattern with spikes in attendance around week six and week eight. It is important to note that there are error bars associated with the in-person data because the data collected was estimated. We assume that there were more people that attended than was actually recorded because not all students were able to sign in when attending sessions. However, in the virtual space, the attendance data was more accurate as the number of students who attended the sessions were documented onto the platform. Because of human error and other associated challenges with taking attendance data, these are only approximate numbers. Regardless, total attendance was very similar between both semesters. However, student attendance for various courses differed slightly. Here it can be seen that the attendance rate for biology had significantly increased from fall 2019 from 12% to 36%, while the attendance rate for chemistry overall had significantly diminished from 36% to 16%. This may be due to the fact that Biology 200 became more dependent on Fresca, hosting tutorials through the Fresca program. However, Chem 212 made tutorials mandatory for the students and hosted these sessions separate from the Fresca program. 
These changes resulted in the differences seen in attendance for each course. Math and physics generally remained the same, reflecting that the course structure had not significantly changed. Comparing the qualitative survey data from the in-person and virtual semesters, we generated Venn diagrams outlining the general pros and cons of each format. For the pros in both formats, students have indicated that Fresca is at least a useful resource for their study. Specifically for the in-person format, students indicated that Fresca provides a good study environment that is less intimidating than other resources like office hours and an open space for pair-pair interaction and collaborations. For the virtual format, we have more TAs and mentors running the sessions for more one-on-one -on -one help and also more times to accommodate for the different time zones. The online format is also relatively more accessible as students do not have to travel to a physical location to access Fresco. So some specific responses from the in-person survey are presented in this slide. From the first two responses, students indicate that Fresca is super useful and that the TAs help with their understanding. Here, the student appreciates the access to free one-on-one -on -one tutoring and that the environment is very welcoming and non-judgmental. Students have also mentioned that Fresca is more convenient and less intimidating to a first year, creating a productive study environment. On this slide, responses from the virtual Fresca survey are displayed. In general, students found Fresca to be useful for reviewing what they have already learned from lectures. Virtual Fresca also proved to be helpful for assessments. For example, a student commented, I like Fresca sessions because they allow me to do more practice problem sets for Biology 200 and are the only sources of exercise I get to prepare for my assessments. Virtual Fresco also proved beneficial for completing physics assignments and receiving one-on-one -on -one help from TA and team mentors of seem more simple in the online format. So on the other hand, there's also areas of limitations in both formats. For instance, students have expressed concerns over the times offered, which may not always fit into their class schedules or their time zones. Students have also indicated that in some instances, the peer mentors can be too busy with other students to answer their questions, or some may struggle to answer the questions altogether. Specifically for the in-person format, many students thought the location is not ideal and changes in the schedule may not always be communicated effectively. Additionally, some students also expressed a need for expanded course offerings. In the virtual format, students have complained that MS Teams can be harder to navigate and less familiar. There's also less collaborations between students, promoting for Fresca can be ineffective online, and of course there's also the online barriers like internet and technical issues. So here are some specific comments in regards to the weaknesses of in-person Fresca. In the first response, we can see that students indicate a long waiting period before receiving help from a mentor, and on some days, the mentors may not even show up at all. Other students have commented that incorporating higher level classes may be helpful and that holding Fresca in the cafeteria can make it hard to concentrate. Additionally, students have expressed the need for expanded hours and more available mentors during the sessions. In regards to virtual Fresca cons, there were online barriers such as problems with the MS Teams platform. Zoom appeared to be a possible solution to such technical problems experienced with MS Teams, but we will have to weigh the pros and cons between MS Teams and Zoom to decide which we value more. Collaboration opportunities also seem to be an issue as students felt there needed to be more opportunities to bond with other students and work together. Moreover, clarity on what Fresca is was not established for some students and revealed that promotion could use some improvement. Although there were many TAs and team mentors enrolled, some students still found that during busy times, they were unavailable because there were a lot of students asking questions if something was due soon. Moreover, some students suggested that more time slots were needed later in the week to actually allow them to cover the week's materials before they attend sessions. So that was a brief description of the research we conducted on the Fresca program. We will now conclude by summarizing what we talked about and proposing ideas for changes to be made moving forward. 
In summary, today we discussed in-person versus virtual collaborative learning environments using Fresca as an example. We talked about the in-person to virtual transition experiences, including the use of the MS Teams platform, the effect virtual learning had on attendance, and some associated challenges with both forms of Fresca. We also discussed pros and cons of both formats using qualitative data from surveys. Considering all that we have discussed, we thought that one possible option moving forward would be to create a hybrid version of Fresca. By using both the in-person and virtual forms of Fresca, it will give students the option to attend any version most suitable for them. Therefore, the hybrid format would create increased flexibility and accessibility for students. We would also be able to adjust the needs of both formats by removing the challenges or the cons associated with each format. However, some limitations to introducing a hybrid format include the limited availability of resources, providing enough TAs or team mentors willing to be a part of one format over another may be a potential issue as well as planning for every possible scenario, such as lockdowns will need to be addressed. We want to thank you all for attending our session and listening to our presentation. If you have any questions or wish to have an open discussion about the Fresca program or learning communities in general, feel free to join us in the breakout room later on. For those interested, here are some of the thought questions that we will be discussing in the breakout room sessions. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Lily. Um, okay, so I guess uh, now we're going to have our last presentation, uh, but uh, later we're going to again have three breakout rooms so it can communicate more in depth with our authors and presenters. So, Veronique, if you're ready, you can take it over. Thanks so much, Chad. No problem. All right. Good morning, everyone. Bon matin. My name is Veronique, as Chad said, and I'm joined by Rhonda Amsel, my colleague. We're from the Office of Science Education at McGill, a unit supporting teaching and learning in the Faculty of Science. So I'll just make this full screen and we'll get going. Okay. So if you've got any questions while I'm chatting, Rhonda's going to be keeping an eye on the chat. So please feel free to, to drop anything in there. Thank you, Veronique. Uh, we got a little bit uh, chat. Uh, could you speak a little bit louder? Yeah. That's everything. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is that better now, the volume-ish? Okay, let's try that. Good, all right. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> awesome. So I'll just reshare my screen then. And hopefully, okay, Teams isn't working being finicky this morning. So I'll just switch to PowerPoint. Sorry for the mix up here. Okay, let's give this a try. All right, working, super. So today we're going to talk about our pilot project that we ran over the winter semester to engage instructors in pedagogical discussion. So a little roadmap for the conversation today. We'll start off by talking about the project, which we're calling the Living Library, and then we'll shift gears to share some data that we collected from a feedback survey, asking instructors what they got out of the discussions and how it may have change their teaching practices moving forward. And finally, if you join us in the breakout room later, we'll talk about how we're envisioning keeping the conversations going. So moving these discussions, perhaps in person, as we gradually transition back to in-person teaching and learning environments. So about the Living Library Project, it really came about late last fall semester in 2020. And the idea came from conversations about how we could support instructors with the continued remote delivery into the winter semester. And so last summer and into the fall, the Office of Science Education, or O's for short, we um, carried out consultations with instructors to help them adapt their courses 
for the remote fall context. We also hosted many teaching and learning events to discuss practices and strategies for remote teaching and learning. And so from those conversations and from feedback from those events and initiatives, we learned that instructors were seeking simple strategies that they could integrate into their remote courses to enhance the learning experience of their students, but that with the additional workload burden of delivering a course online in, in a remote context, they didn't necessarily have the time to look for these instructional strategies on their own. On the flip side of that, through all these conversations, we knew there were some really great strategies being used in classrooms already in the fall. And so that's where the Living Library idea came from, is that we wanted to provide a virtual community space where instructors could come together to exchange ideas and talk about teaching. So that's the first part of the Living Library, that we really want to build a community where it was just a platform to allow instructors to speak to each other. So the idea was that we would have 45 minute recorded discussions. We kept the group size quite small, just to five to seven instructors to make it more of an informal gathering space. And each discussion that we had, so we had four over the winter semester was on a pre-identified topic of interest to the instructors. So one of the sessions looked at first day of class strategies to engage students right on day one. The next one looked at communicating with TAs and students. And then the final two discussions focused on remote feedback and assessment. So knowing that not everyone could attend these discussions or may not have been interested in attending these discussions, we still wanted to share what nuggets of wisdom came out of them, so strategies and reflections on the lived-in experience of remote teaching. So because the discussions were recorded, what we did is we created what we're calling a, a living library of um, online strategies. So we took the recordings and we segmented them into short video clips of about one to three minutes on individual strategies or reflections on the lived in experience of teaching in the remote context. And we uploaded these to our website. So what I'll do now is I'll just share the link for the living library in the chat. You're welcome to take a peek at it if you'd like or explore it in your own time. It is a work in progress, so if you've got any feedback for how we could design it so that it's easy to navigate or perhaps a different way of representing information, we're, we're all ears, um, so we welcome any feedback that you might have. So over the course of the winter semester, like I said, we hosted four discussions and they went really well. Uh, the instructors who attended were very engaged. It was a very animated discussion. Um, instructors who attended were asked to share one strategy that was working well for them in the remote course. So they had to present for two, three minutes, no PowerPoint slides, no prep really, just to come and talk. And this seemed to work really well. Uh, following everyone's presentations, there was a lot of discussion about the nuts and bolts of each person's strategy, and people were very engaged in just asking each other about their teaching experience, both from the fall and then through the winter as well. So over the course of this project, we had 14 instructors participate in discussions. They represented seven out of the 10 faculty of science disciplines and departments. So we had quite a range of disciplines coming together to exchange ideas, which was very encouraging. So I'm just going to do a new share. I was planning on showing a YouTube video. So I just have to switch screens very quickly. Okay. Hopefully the audio will behave this time. So I want to just give you a bit of an idea of what these discussions looked like. So this is one of the video clips from the session on strategies for communicating with students. And so I won't show the whole clip, I'll just show the first minute or so. But what you'll see is Danielle and Jessica are speaking to how they're using discussion boards in their classes. And they're sort of comparing the format and, and what they're doing and why and also asking each other questions. So let's see if this works. Just maybe give me a thumbs up if you can hear the sound. 
what I really like is what you were saying though about uh, splitting your students into groups on the discussion boards. We do something similar, but um, we actually have them split into groups of 20 for their tutorials. So I, I might think about in, in integrating those groups into the, the discussion board. Make them correspond. Yeah, but then what I'm yeah. curious about is, are you ever worried like, you know, we have a lot of posts on the discussion board that I am so thankful that the whole class has access to because something gets brought up that I'm glad that everyone can see and I can point the whole class to, hey, check out this specific yeah. piece. It, do you have the ability to allow correspondence between those groups or is that like totally blocked? It's not really. So the way that we did it, I don't think that you could. So a TA would have five of these groups and I can't have a, I, we can't have small tutorial groups because we don't have enough TAs. Um, so the TA, actually virtual tutorials were uh, better attended than live tutorials. That was something that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and, but the groups were separate, but, but I did have a system with my TAs, like on a weekly basis, we would move stuff to an FAQ. So that's just to give you an idea of how the discussions went. It was really nice to see how engaged the instructors were in the conversation as a facilitator and Wanda was also a facilitator. We sort of just hung back and really let the conversation be carried by, by the instructors. Um, and very rarely did we have to jump in to sort of provide prompts to keep the conversation going. So I'll just jump slides. So from our point of view, this seemed to be serving a need. It seemed as though the instructors really appreciated the opportunity to speak with each other, not only with colleagues in their own disciplines, but across disciplines. But of course, we want to see what they were getting out of the experience. And so this spring, we sent around a short feedback survey for them, only about five minutes, to probe two questions. The first was, what about this experience. Um, so what aspects of the Living Library discussion, how it was set up, or the purpose enhanced your experience in the sessions that you attended. And the second was sort of what takeaways did you get out of this? So how likely were you to incorporate strategies that you'd learned about into your own teaching practices? And would you come back to this space again for further future discussions? So when thinking about how we want to probe instructors, we decided on the participant assessment of learning gains survey. So this is a survey that generally is used to assess learning gains from participants in learning communities. So their perceptions of how the learning community went. We consider the living library discussions as sort of pop-up learning communities because people are coming together on a specific topic to satisfy both their own individual and group goals. So in this case with the Living Library it was to exchange strategies on the topic, get feedback on strategies that instructors were using in their courses and to hear new ideas if they had questions on specific aspects of those topics. So this felt like an appropriate survey to use. So I'll just show you a bit of who responded to the survey. So of the 14 instructors that participated in the discussions, we had 11 respond to the survey, so a 79% response rate. And what was really interesting to see, and this perhaps may have been a bit of selection bias on our part where we reached out to, to participate in the li living library and who agreed to participate, but we had quite a range of years of teaching experience at McGill. So we had a, a large proportion of what we call junior faculty, so zero to three years of teaching at McGill, and then the rest was divided between more senior faculty and faculty who were quite senior in their years of teaching at McGill. So it was a really nice range of teaching experience represented in these discussions. We also had quite a range of uh, course contexts too. So aside from different disciplines, we also had very different class sizes um, being represented in these discussions. Again, we had quite a large proportion of large classes. So these are ones with over 500 Sorry, 500 students um, in Faculty of Science, we do have quite large class sizes. 
And then there were also some instructors who were teaching more moderately sized classes as well as smaller courses as well, under 100 students. So overall, we had quite a range of experiences, disciplines, and, and class sizes represented. And yeah, Bruno, 500 plus is, is a lot. It's <laughs> I really commend all these instructors for finding interesting ways of engaging students online in those class sizes. So looking at what aspects enhanced the instructor's experience in the discussions, we asked about the format. So we asked if the small group size played any, any part in how they enjoyed the discussions, as well as the casual conversation setting, the cross-discipline discussion, as well as the purpose to share strategies and to learn strategies from colleagues. And so while all these aspects seem to enhance to some degree participants' um, engagement and experience in the group discussions, it seems to be that the learning strategies from colleagues and the small group size um, were the aspects that most enhanced their experience. So along with these scale questions, we also had some open comments. And I just want to share this one because I feel like it summarizes very nicely all the other comments. So this person said, I really appreciated the opportunity to share with and learn from colleagues teaching large classes in other departments. It was nice to hear from other instructors about their strategies for handling the day-to-day -day tasks involved with their own classes. So the strategies that were shared really ranged from maybe more complex that spanned throughout a semester to very simple things like how I use the chat to engage students. So it was really nice to see um, instructors engaging with each other and just being very comfortable sharing whatever strategies they felt very strongly about were working for them. This is where it gets interesting. Um, how likely are you to attend future discussions, implement strategies discussed, or talk about teaching outside the living library? So while instructors indicated that they would most likely attend future discussions, and or implement discuss strategies, we saw a shift towards somewhat unlikely to talk about teaching outside of the living library, which we thought was interesting. So while this space seemed to be valuable and they appreciated the experience, they might not be likely to talk about teaching outside of a dedicated space like this. So if you join us in the breakout room, we'd love to hear from you what we can do to promote discussion about teaching in a larger sense. And also, do you think a project like this might work in your course context to bring together instructors to talk about teaching. So with that, I'll stop sharing. I just want to say thank you very much for your time. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you all. Oh, thank you, Veronic. Thank you so much. Okay, so now if we may start the breakout rooms. Uh, I just opened all breakout rooms. I think uh, you should be able to select the room you would like to get in. So we have three rooms, A, B, C. Uh, I would suggest that we just go for the order of our presentation. So the group A would be uh, Polybeck and uh, the colleagues, and group B would be Great Iris and the colleagues, and group C will be Veronic. And uh, I think the audiences should be able to choose the group you want to participate. If not, let me know. Uh, you can mute yourself, ask questions, or you can put in the chat. I'll figure that out. But since uh, we have presenters already get into their rooms, uh, prepare, uh, start to get ready for the Q&A session or more in-depth conversation. So feel free to go now. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. So <laughs> hope you had a great conversation and sorry about this kind of Fitness about <laughs> signing ourselves in the room. Um, I, I used the existing one, but clearly there was a kind of limited access to you know everyone's. So next time, I remember I create my own and I'll share the lesson with the rest of chairs so that maybe in your future sessions there won't be a problem. Okay, and uh, I guess because now it's kind of the time, uh, that's why I put everyone back here. And I just want to thank you so much for participating in Southeast and uh, in this session. And thank you all the presenters, all the authors and all, all the papers being shared. Uh, it's a great learning opportunity. And it's, uh, I guess it's a community kind of uh, rich for resources available to us. And uh, I'll keep this, uh, 
uh, opening, uh, just in case, you know, uh, I know some of you, you because the access issues, you might be able to talk to the, uh, to the people you like to. So I'll leave it open and you can let me know if you, you know, want to get into a breakout rooms, have a more in-depth uh, conversation. Uh, if not, uh, I guess uh, welcome you to add our other sessions of Southeast and especially we have a gather town. There's a social networking kind of space there. We have the trees, we have fountains, we have beach and the rooftop. So you can enjoy your conversation as little as possible. Okay, so, and thank you so much. And any words from the presenters or from audiences you'd like to share? Thank you. Thanks everyone. everyone great presentations, great discussions. Thank you so much. Bye, have a good rest of the day and we'll see you around in other sessions.